Uh, so this is a right orbit. Uh, they frequently ask like what border is the optic canal or the superior orbital fissure. So you want to be thinking of your sphenoid bones. The one little tidbit is at the frontoethmoidal suture marks the inferior extent of the anterior cranial fossa. So if you go above that line and you go through the bone, then you'll be in the intracranial. So it's a surgical landmark. And they like to ask the bones of the orbit. So uh, there's lots of mnemonics out there for those. This is my little chart for the fissures. You want to know which things go through what. And um, that's, I'm not going to go too much in the detail here, but just as a little refresher, that's some of that there. This little diagram here of the blood flow particularly the anterior part is, is what they ask about. So the short posterior so their arteries and recurrent choroidals are for the prelaminar, the circle of sin and the laminar space. And um, the rest has different distributions of the central retinal artery, branch of the ophthalmic artery and fetal vessels. You may remember that the intracranial optic nerve is the anterior uh, carotid and the anterior communicating. And the posterior circulation uh, with the circle of Willis goes back to some old anatomy from step one and step two, but uh, it does have some clinical importance. Uh, there is some nice dual supply things, um, and the optic tract is one of those and lateral triculate nucleus. So you may remember the anterior choroidal and the posterior lateral choroidal arteries uh, for their specific uh, visual fields that injuries from those would result in. I'm gonna skip this question. There'll be some questions here, so we'll have some feedback uh, so you guys don't fall asleep on me. But uh, they expect a deficit of optic tract injury. This one's too easy. You'll have a contralateral hemianosaminopia, contralateral RAPD, contralateral band atrophy of the optic nerve hidden. As you can see on this diagram here. Uh, venous flow, maybe you more see this on neuroimaging, uh, but there's some specific cause of optoceliary shunt vessels, which you want to have a little uh, differential for, these being the most common ones, CRVO, nerve sheath meningioma, glaucoma, chronic papilledema. Mm. Good old sympathetic autonomic system. Um, you'll want to have a picture of this in your head. Um, and you can divide it up into the three different uh, nerve chains, but uh, I feel like it doesn't get asked too much on OCAPs. You may remember that the sympathetics get to the orbit through the nasociliary and long ciliary nerves. I mean, that's a little tidbit that uh, isn't so fresh to the, or isn't so easily brought to memory. Similarly with the parasympathetics, um, you're primarily thinking Edinger Westfall, short ciliary nerve uh, from the ciliary ganglion, but um, there's also the lacrimation uh, component of it. So that has a, oops, a different path, of course. Uh, so these will end up going through the inferior orbital fissures. That's one of the things in the inferior orbital fissures, the parasympathetics. Number two, I think everyone gets this one pretty well. And number three um, does have many nuclei. So um, everything's it's lateral except the superior rectus. So you have to think of that in your nuclear uh, cranial nerve three lesions. The levator is bilateral. And then there's this uh, proportion that goes for accommodation and then for the light reflex, which I thought I edited here, but yeah, 10 times as many fibers for accommodation. And that's one of the anatomic bases for uh, light near dissociation. So number four, the one we all know and love uh, has a little decusation, it does decusate approximately and um, exits along the dorsal surface. We'll get more into cranial number four a little later. Number five, uh, V1 and V2 go through the cavernous sinus. Uh, and 
Um, you might recall the uh, standing room only thing for the foramen that those go through. Okay, nerve six. Uh, remember this one's, this is the one that's in the substance of the cavernous sinus, so it's more vulnerable to compression. And uh, it initiates horizontal gaze through the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, nerve seven, we'll get into that a little bit later too. And this is why the efferent exam in neuroethymology is so complicated because there's a lot of cortical input from many different areas. Uh, so it's poorly localizing, uh, unfortunately. But in general, you can think of vertical movements being the midbrain and horizontal movements being controlled by the palms. That's not asked too frequently on OCAP, so we won't get much in detail for that. Okay, so you'll get lots of photos for your OCAPs and um, does someone want to interpret this photo here on your left? Let's go with Cole. How did I know you're going to pick me? <laughs> um, you're the last one that spoke. <laughs> photo of the left optic nerve. Do the fields go with the photo? No, 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 sorry. Okay. Um, I, maybe a little pallorous, but I don't see a whole lot else. Yeah, it's normal. Great job. Oh, it's, great. Um, thanks, thanks, man. For recognizing normal, you'll usually get four pictures. One will be normal. One will be, you know, maybe then I'll have three pathologic nerves, and you got to figure out which one they're describing in the stem. That's a very typical question. So there's your normal one. Uh, I only have this one here because they have the uh, sizes for the for the lights. Just remember one of them and then divide by four for each number. So the five size is 64 millimeters square. Or square millimeters. We usually use the three, which is 16. So hopefully you can remember one of those and use your rule of four from there. You won't ever interpret uh, these visually vocal potentials, but they may mention that and it's quite helpful that knowing that the latency is prolonged in demyelination and if it's the amplitude that's more of the ischemic or compressive uh, object neuropathies. Right, so um, we're going to dig into a little more specifics. So um, they love to ask about the super rare things in OCAPs as well as in boards. So uh, sometimes you have a pretty normal examination, but they're having either um, visual acuity loss or photopsias, metamorphopsias, and you're trying to determine what they're describing. So be aware of your white dot syndromes as well as some of the other more uh, retinopathy type of things that can be confusing uh, in the question stem. So uh, I think I, yeah. so that's just a little reminder to don't forget your retinopathies that are, can be uh, with a pretty normal fundus examination. You'll have a broad differential, of course. This is more clinical, I guess, than OCAP related. Let's get this one. And we're all very used to acute papilledema. I think from your call days, we get plenty of those. You see it quite frequently, but these are some of the signs that they may show in pictures that you can, or have written in the question stem. That should make you think of an acute process. All right, we have another photo. Uh, Brandon. Yeah, so um, it looks like there is swelling of the nerve. You can see patent lines um, circumferentially. Uh, I would say minimal um, vessel obscuration. Um, and then you don't also have paler. I don't appreciate any drusen. Um, that being said, without vessel obscuration, I'd be somewhat concerned for pseudodrusen. I mean, pseudopapilledema. Um, hey, nice job, man. This is a pseudo example of pseudopapilledema. This is actually from the BSC. Thanks. These lines here would have fooled me as well, but if you're, you may think like more of a hyperemic disc if you're having a true edema. 
uh, or some vessel obscuration with what looks to be like a lot of swelling if you're looking at the disc margin, but the vessels are pretty clear. So this is a pseudo papilledema, probably from Jersey. Um, I think I saw Allie. Yeah, Allie, what you got on this second one? Uh, this is a disc. It looks um, almost like the appearance that you would get with maybe like chronic edema, where it's kind of got this fibrosis at the disc margin, um, or it could be myelinated because um, the disc itself doesn't look like it has pallor, but it also could be obscuring. I don't know. Yeah, this is another pseudopapilledema. I think there's a good two things that you brought up. This is, I think, Pretty sure this is supposed to be myelinated in our fiber layer. It is kind of broad. It's covering like you know more than six o'clock hours, which I think would be a little atypical, but uh, yeah, good job. Sorry, let's get this. There's your differential for pathodema. Very short differential. Uh, so yeah, chronic uh, pathodema has its own little findings and uh, Maybe Marshall, you want to describe, or what do you think this one is here? Obviously, it's chronic papilledema, but what are some of the findings that were? Yeah, so here you um, you can definitely see still a little bit blurring of the disc, mar disc margin, um, or, and then you can see some of the gliosis that's happening. Um, yeah. 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 This, so this is gliosis, which does look pretty similar to that last one. Nice job. I H. I felt like you don't get many questions on this one, but obviously it has a lot of clinical importance. You may try to remember or be tipped off with some of these associations for pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, yeah, I think that's an easy one. If they ask you a question about that, you'll get it. There are some findings. Uh, again, I don't think they'll ask you much about I H because it's too too easy for OCAPs. You need more esoteric things. Mm, yeah, I won't ask you much about treatment either. And I don't think that'll be a question. There, there are some products of factors that they list in the BCSC for these five things, which I try to remember, but uh, I don't think that'll be a question either. Object neuritis is a good one. Um, there's, of course, many different flavors of optic neuritis, but uh, typical is the MS associated one was all this data is coming from the optic neuritis treatment trial. So uh, most of those patients had or were evaluated for multiple sclerosis. It was kind of pre MOG and NMO. Uh, pain, of course, being a big tip off in a normal fundus exam. And there's many atypical features here that should make you think of other things. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're having funnest findings, then maybe don't think multiple sclerosis, think something else. Treatment, optic treatment trial, they might ask you about this. Uh, basically, that oral is not used anymore. Sometimes there's old questions that are pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah, oral prednisone, prednisone, uh, increased risk of recurrence. And they won't ask you about any of the MS drugs, like in particular. There are some pretty classic rules, 25, 50, 75 rule uh, with risk conversion of MS. Um, so that is, if they have no lesions, they have 25% to convert to MS in 15 years. And if they do, they have 75 or almost 75% chance. And if you don't get an MRI, then they're like in the 50% range. NMO may have some spine photos, perhaps. Uh, diagnostic criteria here. I don't think you'll be asked any specifics about this, but good clinical information to have in the back of your head. Uh, neuroretinitis, neuroretinitis is a Good OCAP question. Uh, you'll typically will have more of an acute vision loss and have 
uh, may have a normal macula in the early stages, which is what this one shows here, and only develop the macular star or those exudates on this side. There's many different organisms, which we're going to skip that question, but um, who else is here? Lydia, which layer will the exudates accumulate? Um, I'm wondering if it would be Henley's layer, but I honestly don't know right now. Nailed it. Sorry. Well done. Perfect. All right, perineuritis. I don't see this too much, uh, but the, the it's one of the other painful eye movement uh, entities. You do typically get some visual field loss, but not to the degree of optoneuritis. Um, and you definitely need to treat it with steroids. That's one of those things that um, if it's kind of, that's what they're showing you on MRI with the nerve, uh, sorry, the dural sheath enhancement, uh, you'll want to treat with steroids and it should respond quite rapidly. So uh, this is a little comparison between arteritic and not arteritic. Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't think any of this is too groundbreaking here. It's good to know that their symptoms are sometimes minimal, uh, but the transient uh, diplopia and transverse obscurations are good ophthalmologic things that hopefully will pick up in your uh, review systems. This is a pretty uh, like typical setup for these questions. I'll go through these. I think we've done these before, but uh, the top frame is the right and left eye for someone with an eye on the left eye, the disc brisk on the right eye, and the bottom two are uh, typical giant cell arteritis edema. So the right side doesn't have a disc at risk, and the left side has this kind of yellowish, chalky, like no blood is getting to that area uh, appearance. And let's get through some of this. Meningiomas are uh, meningiomas and gliomas are at least one question typically. So, big tip off is age. So, if you're having a meningioma, you're typically the middle aged uh, women, and uh, they have it. I believe it's supposed to be a triad, but optic atrophy in the optociliary shunt, vessel, shunt vessels. Hmm. I think there was a third, supposed to be a third thing there, but um, so that's something that if you see some shunt vessels, you're going to have to image them because they may have the nerve sheath from the geoma. And we'll get to the comparison here. So gliomas are typically younger, 90% by the second decade, um, and proptosis is quite common with it. The big thing is comparing the two. So. Uh, we have a CT here, which can be used. Um, who else is out there? Sean, what do you see and what is the diagnosis? Uh, so, uh, looks like in the in the right orbit, the there's some enhancement of the. Uh, optic nerve sheath um and i mean when i'm thinking about that it could be a perineuritis could be a um a glioma with sort of a fusiform enlargement it also could be a, a meningioma with more of a tram tracking appearance uh nice yeah so this is a ct and so uh, oh, sorry ct it's yeah. like thickening yeah. thickening of the nerve sheath is what it's trying to display here and there is you can kind yeah. of imagine a tram tracking if it was an mri we'll get some mris too um, so yeah this is more of the glioma style there's the donut sign for meningioma nerve sheath meningioma this is mri and this is the more uh, globular shape of glioma not the best imaging, to be honest, but I'm pretty sure these are photos from the BCSC. 
So here's all that together. Um, some things to point out. The meningioma has diffuse tubular enlargement classically. Um, and you may have this tram tracking. That's what you'll typically find on your OCAPs. The glioma has a kinking or buckling um, or can be, but can be fusiform, which these can be fusiform. If it's fusiform glioma, then it can be challenging. But typically you can make out the nerve on nerve sheath meningioma and glioma. It's hard to distinguish like a distinct optic nerve because the whole thing is intrinsic to, the, to that tissue. Okay, so uh, they love labors. So uh, this is more males than females, typically in the younger crowd, and it has does have a mitochondrial inheritance, most typical, uh, typically sequential within a few months, and uh, end up with central or papillomacular uh, visual field loss. This one, you can have some pseudoedema as well. Peripapillary telentectasias are a good thing to pick out on fundus photo. And the mu mutations are, um, I don't know, for me, I, I feel like they do ask about these, but um, the 11778 is most common and the worst, and the 14484 is the best. So here's some of those photos. Um, you can kind of see hyperemia, hyperemia the disc here uh, with the tortuosity, pseudoedema. And then this is presumably going to be the next eye to deal with that. You can get some uh, staining of the disc, not particularly with much leakage. All right, next one. I think there's someone else I haven't called on. Tony? So you have optopus photos of both eyes and it looks to be temporal pallor. What do you think it is? It looks pallorous to me. But... Right, what's the diagnosis? Uh, diagnosis could be some kind of optic neuropathy, um, maybe nutritional, We're in the toxic. We're in the hereditary. Oh, system. oh, we're still there. Okay. Um, <laughs> could be uh, autosomal dominant optic atrophy. Nice. Well done. So, um, yes, this is uh, the OPA gene, our chromosome three, also thought to be mitochondrial. Uh, it's nice to remember this one has that blue yellow uh, deficit, so tritinopia. Uh, that's a good question I thought I didn't ask. That temporal pallor in a young kid that failed a vision screen exam uh, is the typical stem. So, yes. Drusen, everyone loves Drusen. Uh, remember retinitis pigmentosa and pseudoxanthoma elasticum as the commonly associated very rare diseases. Um, I think we can skip these, the photos are more important. So um, all of these photos are Drusen, so I won't test anyone on these, uh, but just pick out these little small refractile bodies here, 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 they're kind of peppered all over on this one. This one has somewhat irregular blurred margins as well. This one has very clear Drusen also has that blurred margin. You can have these little uh, ILM things that will make it look like it's swollen. We have some really dramatic ones. This is supposed to point out this anomalous vascular branching, which can sometimes be associated. And then if you see this, maybe think of something else. Um, Cole, we're back to you. What else? What, uh, what is this? Uh, like an astrocytic hamartoma. Very nice. Mulberry lesion. They love to ask about phacomatoses. I don't have that much in my um, presentation, but uh, this is one of those. Um, can be with tuberous sclerosis. So 
or congenital uh, optic nerve hypoplasia. Where you about? Okay, so. Uh, 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 fetal alcohol syndrome is can be uh, pointed out with this one. Let me show you a kid with um, telecanthus and that um, long enlarged or prolonged filtrum with uh, with optic nerve hypoplasia. You may have this kind of double ring sign. Not very actually not, not super clear on this photo, but uh, that's what that one's supposed to be. Um, there is a spectrum of optic nerve head anomalies, which include optic pit, coloboma, uh, nerve dysplasia, and morning glory anomaly. And I thought to all be to some extent uh, the same embryologic process. Uh, but optic pit, you're thinking infrotemporal, that's an, a nice one. And you can have these serious macular attachments in a good portion of them. Globomas are uh, infranasal. And typically associated with uh, chorioretinal uh, colobomas as well. Uh, this has like a, um, a very bright, not bright, but like an egg white type of picture to it. It's, it's pretty uh, distinct. I'm sure you'll recognize that. This plastic nerve, you'll typically have a central retinal vessel attenuation. And uh, you may even have uh, non perfusion in the periphery. And it's associated with this PAX2 papillorenal syndrome. Same with morning glory, uh, morning glory anomaly. You can also have peripheral non perfusion, but you want to image these because if they're, uh, you're thinking of vascular anomalies like moya moya or uh, basal encephalocele, which um, are an important thing to not. Uh, excise. Transient vision loss. Uh, sometimes they can help you with describing how the vision loss goes. So that may give you some, uh, in, you know, inkling that this is a retinal emboli as opposed to some of the other things like uh, bilateral vision loss would be close to your circulation. Uh, geometric qualities, thinking of occipital lobe dysfunction. So that could be a uh, migraine, gazy vote, or mass. So that may be helpful to look at specific things on the exam. PIAs, uh, I think the big thing here is um, you, we send them to the stroke unit. So that's typically the management question is you have one of these retinal artery emboli, and it's now pretty well supported that uh, we don't mess around with those, we send them for stroke. Some other things that you think of from giant cell arthritis, ocular hyperperfusion from CRBO, uh, ocular emic syndrome. Um, and I personally like ocular ischemic syndrome, so we'll go a little bit to this. Exposure to light will cause it, and uh, it can have positional uh, positional qualities as well. You're typically going to have, you know, the, like a typical veteran that has a lot of vascular risk factors to help you lead you this to this uh, diagnosis. Vasospasm is diagnosis of exclusion, and uh, you may have some hyperviscosity that can lead to transmission loss as well, like polycythemia veteran. And so chorea does not equal an afferent pupillar defect. This is efferent defect. I think you've all seen this before, because I think, I think I've probably given you this before. But if you have a smaller and dim lighting, you have a problem with dilation, that's sympathetic. If you have greater and bright light, that's a problem with constriction, that's parasympathetic. And you can use the cocaine test to distinguish Warner syndrome and physiologic or the epiclonidine test and then use your slit lamp and pilocarpine on your uh, on the other side here. Or syndrome, a sensitive finding is dilation lag. And this is what you'll find with that. So um, 
with apiclonidine, you'll have reversal of anisocoria. And with cocaine, you'll have uh, an, like greater anisocoria. The normal people react in the abnormal. If we do the hydroxyamphetamine anymore, I think it's out of the questions as well. Can be some helpful systemic neurologic uh, findings to help you localize it. And again, having this picture of the anatomy in your head can be helpful. Mm. For light near dissociation, another good one for uh, anisocoria, dorsal midbrain syndrome uh, is a typical or a classic one. So uh, you'll have a beating nystagmus, conversion traction nystagmus, accommodative precess, and uh, you may even have the upgaze palsy. Uh, there are some eponyms that go with these that are, I can't quite think of right now. The Argyll, Robertson pupils, the syphilis, or some of these uh, autonomic disorders, even uh, heavy PRP can give you that. And aberrant regeneration is a good one uh, to keep in mind as well, um, because the new reflex typically either is sustained or regrows, but the light reflex uh, is not as uh, robust. But this is only with trauma or compression and is not with ischemia. And AD tonic pupil, which um, I had other slides on, but you can think of that with the previous slide with the algorithm. They do like to show these um, gaze position photos. Uh, so I'll have someone go through this one as well. Let's see. Um, Sean? Sure. Walk us through your um, process with, uh, with going through these. So, I mean, I suppose the first thing I'm just looking at is, you know, primary gaze, are they ortho? They are. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, really just quickly scanning through and seeing if there's any obvious, uh, you know, misalignment or palsy, um, which I really don't notice in, in the, this set of photos. Yes, this is a normal one. Uh, my helpful tidbit for you is to look at the lid position for these, especially in primary gaze. Uh, that's something that they like try to sneak in is um, either have like a little ptosis or a little reverse ptosis um, in there, or there's um, like one lid doesn't, or like the retraction on down gaze. Like those are usually don't have someone holding up their uh, lids for that, obviously. But remember to look at lid position as well, and not just eye movements when you see these nine, uh, nine gaze photos. 50 year old man presents with diplopia following recent hospitalization for stroke, right head tilt, left hypertropia, diplopia improves with right gaze. Um, Allie, would you like to answer this one? She's still here. Brandon, you go. All right, give me one second here. Right head tilt, left hyper, and improves with right gaze. So I'd be thinking um, left, fourth. Then you can also have excyclotorsion. Let's see, hold on. Yeah, let's go with that. Fourth? You going with the yeah. fourth? Okay. This is a tricky one and one that they'll ask frequently. This is probably actually an ocular tilt reaction of which skew, de skew deviation is part of the ocular tilt reaction. But this one here is showing in cyclotorsion on the left eye. Oh, okay. That's, that's your tip off. That's not fourth. And it doesn't quite follow the fourth nerve pattern and they, they always will on these OCAPs. So if you're, we're going to get to that in just a moment of what the fourth nerve pattern is. Um, but it's, if you're thinking in real world, it's important to think of uh, restrictive causes as well. So uh, thyroid eye disease being very common and predic um, being more common compared to restrictive, at least in their ophthalmology clinic. 
So um, you can determine these by looking at the cicadic velocity, which will be slowed in palsies for suctions if necessary. Uh, this is my little overview for this section. So there's supernuclear, internuclear, intranuclear, and infranuclear causes of diplopia. So uh, we're going to touch mostly on these last two thirds. But these are, uh, you know, tough ones for in clinic, but not for okay. So hard to write questions about. Uh, Screening out of three, remember the anatomy a little bit. Uh, you'll have, if you're having a nuclear lesion, you'll have the contralateral spear rectus involved. Otherwise, it's all intralateral. Um, for the fourth, uh, always be on the lookout for bilateral fourths. They can be tricky, um, but if you're having a trauma and you've been a fourth, you should always be checking for bilateral fourths. Uh, you may have a Horner syndrome if you're having uh, uh, a lesion to the dorsal caudal midbrain. And cranial nerve six is a nuclear lesion is a gaze palsy, not isolated abduction paresis. I'll frequently try to trick people up on that um, with the nuclear compared to infranuclear lesion. So if you're having a nuclear lesion, you also have some seventh nerve signs, uh, like this plot fish weakness, uh, as that fasciculus wraps around the sixth nucleus. INOs, uh, named for their slowed adducting uh, eye. So the left INO uh, will be on the, wait a second. Yes, will be on the left side. So uh, of the MLF will be where your lesion is. Because sixth nerve has can do its thing fine. And then as that signal goes up the midbrain to the third nerve is where that MLF is. That's where that adduction is going to be. That transmission is going to be slow. Uh, you typically will have a skew deviation with that. Um, you're thinking devaluation of young, stroke an old person, uh, but it can be other other things as well. A couple syndromes with this as well. So the one and a half syndrome, I know plus horizontal gaze palsy. So basically, you're including the sixth nerve in addition to the MLF, or sixth nucleus, I should say, in addition to the MLF. And then the eight and a half is that plus the seventh uh, intraaxial uh, physiculus. So you'll get a uh, seventh nerve palsy. I've seen these a few times, I guess, in no caps. So uh, we're not going to go into all of them, but just be aware this is your a time to look at it and maybe remember a couple uh, of these eponyms because they're still out there. If we have time, we can go back to this. People involving thirds are your scary ones. Uh, so uh, as you may remember, the pupil fibers are superficial and uh, on the medial aspect, so it's right next to the where the PCOM and ICA uh, come together. So that's where the aneurysms can affect that. So uh, non traumatic thirds are aneurysm until proof otherwise. Complete thirds without pupil involvement, however, are almost always benign and microvascular because uh, that's, uh, if you think of like the inner substance of cranial nerve three being affected, but the pupil fibers are superficial, so they're still getting some blood supply. So um, your pupil will be fine, but your movements and your ptosis will be complete. Uh, but if you have a partial without, third, without pupil involvement, that is still scary as it may evolve to include the pupillary fibers. So this is a little chart uh, that I made for that. So again, partial thirds, whether the pupil is involved or not, um, you need to rule out an aneurysm or compressive lesion. You have a complete third, but the pupil is fine, then um, you can probably relax a little bit, but you may consider GCA in the right setting. Let's see who's next. Marshall, you still there? Yep, still there. Um... 
describe these, uh, well, describe what's happening in the photo on the right. Um, the photo on the right, you see left-sided ptosis primarily. Um, like, hard to really make out much more than that. Maybe Just the, the opposite, actually. This is down gaze, and uh, this is retraction on the right. Oh, yeah. Mm. This, is a, a, this is a good one. <laughs> Uh, what what process is this? I guess um, that's that's a down and out with a blown pupil on the right. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of pupil on the right. Ignore that. <laughs> this is aberrant regeneration. Down gaze. Um, uh -huh. uh, you're having a third nerve palsy. That now you're having activation of the inferior rectus and the levator at the same time. So that's your. Uh, average generation there. So this is, uh, yeah, synkinesis. Trauma compression, definitely not microvascular if you see average generation. So back to fourth nerve palsies. Um, you have a combination of the tropia, the tilt, and the, um, you may have a chin position as well as uh, being improved in a certain gaze. So the way I remember this, uh, oh, dang it. Yeah, remember these muscle actions as well. You might have that be one thing that you review quickly before you take the test is uh, for the ob obliques, the primary action is the torsion component. So superior be in torsion and then the vertical action, introduction, and then abduction for the obliques. So this is, my way of remembering it, everyone has something a little different. If you're having a fourth and you almost certainly will get one of these questions where you're supposed to do this three-step test um, is to do the, my way to remember it is boot and woog. For me, that's easy to remember, but um, better on opposite tilt or if on opposite gaze. Um, so you can just, if it's that pattern with the appropriate side, uh, then it's gonna be a fourth in these testing situations. So you can not write down your H, H's and circles and all that stuff. Uh, because sometimes time is a, an issue, but uh, this is a quick way to, to identify a fourth firm gaps. Mm, yeah, so you'll have that torsional component. If they talk about a double Maddox rod, they may have this um, lines converging towards the lesion. That's kind of your x torsion which I don't, oh, yeah. So this right eye here is excyclotorted. You can see the macula is kind of too high in relation to the optic nerve. Um, yes. Six nerves. Um, I don't think I have too much to say on this other than this is kind of the gaze center here. So capital lesion again you'll uh, have gaze palsy as opposed to reduced abduction or just reduced abduction. You always think of the six nerves anatomy and think of other processes that could be causing a six nerve, especially uh, if it's congenital, you'll have that Duane syndrome, which can be uh, reduction, abduction, adduction, or both. And you also have globe retraction with uh, Twain syndrome. Um, these are just some things out there. All these uh, supranuclear motor systems. Don't remember these here, but they're going to come up in just a moment. So I included this slide. Uh, skew deviation is an important one to distinguish from the fourth nerve. So use boot and woog and um, You'll typically be A, but sometimes skew deviation can do this in real life, but in OCAPs, it won't. The in torsion, ex torsion is going to be the distinction. This is what ocular tilt reaction is it's the head tilt, skew deviation, and cyclotorsional rotation. So, uh, We've kind of been talking about it indirectly this whole time, but uh, there are 
typically thinking of odorless in the peripheral, but uh, can be central as well. It's midbrain syndrome. Um, discussed this a little bit already, but uh, this is where basically you can have all these different systems affected as they kind of go through this dorsal midbrain. Yeah, I don't think that is too important. Let's get this one. You want to rule out a pineal based tumor if you're having dorsal midbrain syndrome, but it can also be more common things like a stroke or multiple sclerosis. Uh, in newborns, it has a little different presentation with that setting sun sign, and they'll just be stuck in down gaze. Nystagmus is a good one. Um, I think there's a video here, but I'm, ah, dang it. Well, Spasmus nutans has ocular oscillations, the head vomiting, and torticollis. Dang it. Here we go. Um, who's next? Tony, you still there? Yep, still here. Let me just read that real quick. Yes, yeah, 18 year old. Oh, dang it. Hopefully, you didn't see that. 18 year old woman. <laughs> Right nystagmus, when the left eye is covered, left nystagmus, and the right eye is covered. You get some tracings. What do you expect to see in this latent nystagmus? Well, I, I did see the answer. So. <laughs> All right. Well, this one's decelerating. And that's opposed to congenital or infantile nystagmus. This one has the exponentially increasing slow phase. So to go back to this here, that's what these are. Especially increasing slow phase and then a rapid correcting saccade. Increasing velocity, slow phase, correcting saccade. And this is the light nystagmus where it's getting slower on the slow phase. I felt like I was always confused by that, but because they always would put fast phase on there, but like you can't have an accelerating or decelerating fast phase. It's just fast no matter what. So like the, the answer is always one of the slow phase ones. You just have to remember which one is which. Yeah, good point. Fast phase is fast. Can't mess with that. Oh man, we only have five minutes left. So let's see. For the uh, congenital nystagmus, um, you're thinking of a pregeniculate vision loss. So um, foveal hypoplasia, retinal dystrophy, cataracts, most will have strabismus involved as well. Uh, but some that are quite frequent to be idiopathic as well. But um, you especially want to be thinking of pregeniculate causes of vision loss. Uh, latent nystagmus, this is any condition that disrupts binocular development early on, uh, especially infantile exotropia. So, and you can, we'll get some DVDs um, with this. Strabismus is common. Spasmus nutans uh, does tend to resolve later on, uh, but you're mostly thinking of cellar, paracellar uh, tumors as the cause for this. But it, so that's something to check for. Uh, vestibular nystagmus. I, I wish I had more time to go through these, but um, remember the periodic one. I feel like that's one that's actually has really good treatment for it is baclofen. So that may be something that comes up. Baclofen actually works for that one. And this is their chart on DCSC for localizing the lesion. You'll get asked this on your neuro ophthalmology rotation. Yeah, um, one bit about obstetrical uh, One thing they like to ask about is neuroblastoma in kids. Uh, so, one of the presenting signs is obstetrical and sometimes it's an early sign. So it's actually good prognostication if they have obstetrical because it's more outwardly visible. It can be discovered. Um, and one thing that you'll check is the urine for those uh, metabolites of the catecholamines uh, because it's actually pretty sensitive, like 96% or something like that. But in adults, you may think of this ANA one or two antibodies in 
these cancers that tend to have those perineoplastic syndromes. Uh, they almost always ask about Whipple disease in some fashion. So remember Whipple disease as a cause for nystagmus. Myasthenia, I think we're all pretty familiar with that. Sarcoid. Um, TPEO is another rare one that they like to ask about. It's mitochondrial, but sporadic is actually the most common. You tend to have ptosis, but diplopia is actually fairly rare uh, because there tends to be pretty symmetric involvement. You have the buzzword, ragged red fibers, and you'll want to do a cardiac evaluation for conduction deficits. Uh, OPD is another cause of uh, ophthalmoplegia as well as ptosis. Um, you have the French Canadian ancestry for that. And there is a mutation that I used to remember, but I don't remember anymore. Pabin 1, P A B N 1. Thank you. I know we looked it up in clinic one time. You would know <laughs> that's that. The only reason why, that's the only reason why I know. Uh, my talk dystrophy is osmal dominant. I feel like they asked that for some reason. Um, you'll have a lot of systemic signs, but you also want to do a cardiac evaluation for these people. Vision hallucinations, not much for this one. Maybe this will be the last thing. It's eight o'clock. So let's see. Who has time to do this one? Brandon, you have time? Uh, sure. Which one's Gerstmann syndrome? That's when you ignore the other half. No, that's hemispatial like GEC. Gertzman is Alexia Graphia Calcula Finger Agnosia. Nice. Which one's Anton? Anton's the denial because I ain't blind. Yeah. Which one's Blunt? That's the optic ataxia, ocular motor praxia, and the simultignasia. Yep, Riddock is motion, and he's special neglect from last year. Uh, let's see, what did we miss? We didn't get to talk much about ptosis or the seventh nerve and its oddities. So we almost made it. That's like usually people make it through like a quarter of their slides. So that's pretty good. <laughs> well, I hope, you know, it's hard on these reviews to delve into many details. So it is kind of a rapid fire, you know, I, one more time for your subconscious to see these entities. Um, so I hope this was helpful for you. There's um, the I think if you get a really good neuroophthalmology exposure here, so at least compared to what I've experienced, what other people experience. So I hope neuroophthalmology is uh, something to score well on. And I hope if you have any questions, you'll feel free to ask me. I'm happy to help. Eric, Eric could you send up the slides, the PowerPoint? For sure. Just don't distribute them widely. Got it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah.